Hi everyone, my name is Mike Cook, I'm a research fellow at Queen Mary University of London and this is my COG 2021 talk, Monte Carlo Tree Search with Reversibility Compression. Now when the pandemic hit last year, uh, lots of us started doing things we didn't normally do or acting a little bit strange maybe in some cases. Uh, some of us got really into bread making, uh, some of us sort of tended to our gardens and got really into nature. Um, and I, for some reason, decided to write a paper about Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, I sort of went down a huge rabbit hole for several months, and this paper is the result. So Monte Carlo tree search, I don't want to spend too long going into the weeds here, because if you don't know what it is, it won't be super important. You can still get the gist of this talk, but I also don't want to just sort of gloss over it entirely. So Monte Carlo tree search is a way of getting AI agents to play video games. It's a very common algorithm. Obviously, it's used for many other things as well, but in our case, we're interested in the game playing angle. And it has these four stages that you may go through. And this image you may have seen hundreds of times if you know what MCTS is. But essentially, we go through these four steps over and over again to build up what we call a search tree representing different states in the game. So uh, we've got our game here with a little person and a bag of gold or something that we want. Um, and we have our root of the search tree, S. Um, and the first stage is to select a node. In this case, it's easy. We've only got one node, so we're going to select that. Then we expand the node with the possible things that we could do. So in this case, we could move down or we could move right. Then we uh, select one of these uh, options that we're going to sort of play out, as it were. Um, and then we do what's called a rollout. So by that, what we mean is um, we make this move. And then we make a bunch of other moves completely randomly. So we don't think about how we do this. Sometimes it's guided, but you know, traditionally the, the classic version does not guide it at all. And then when we're done, we ask ourselves, okay, what happened? What was the score? What was the reward? We feed this back up the tree and each node in the tree updates its information based on this. So now you can see here, uh, the down node here has been selected once and it has an average score of zero because unfortunately we didn't manage to select the bag to find the bag. Um, and then the next time we go through this tree, instead of choosing the left-hand node, we might choose the right-hand node uh, because it hasn't been selected before, or maybe it's because it has a better average score, not in this case, obviously. And the idea is that in this case, for example, as we move right, the random playout is more likely to find the bag. Um, and thus, over time, we slowly end up choosing uh, better and better options as we get more and more information about um, the game and its space. Now MCTS does have some situations that it doesn't like. It doesn't like performing in. Um, so for example, if there's a scenario where the rollouts, these random playouts, are not getting good feedback, um, then MCTS might struggle here to kind of get what we want from it. So in this case, our, our person kind of just wanders around up this top here because none of its random playouts end up finding the bag. And so it just sort of goes back and forth. It doesn't really know where to go. And there are, of course, ways around this. There are lots of sort of specialized versions of MCTS, but I'm talking about sort of the classic approach here. And there are also scenarios where MCTS agents kind of do work that it's already done um, without realizing. So for example, we could take this route uh, here around sort of looping back on ourselves and then ending back up on here on the left. Um, and this would be one side of the tree, like a load of actions ending in some tree N, some tree node N. Um, but then, of course, we might end up exploring another part of the search tree, another sequence of actions, which ends up in the same place. It ends up in exactly the same game state. And so we've ended up sort of duplicating our work here and making the tree much bigger than it needs to be. And the bigger this tree is, the more of a problem MCTS has, because it has more nodes to search through, more nodes to balance, more nodes to consider. Um, and it's just generally a lot more work for the algorithm. Now, in many of the scenarios where MCTS is commonly applied, uh, these problems don't actually crop up that much. I'm thinking here board games, card games, um, certain adversarial video games. But in general, they are more common in video games. And in my field, automatic game design, they are very common, particularly in badly designed games, which we see a lot of in AGD. Now, one of the reasons for this is that uh, video games are what I call dilute. So we think of uh, moving around in a game like this one, which is soccer band, where we're sort of pushing boxes and moving around the world. We think of these actions in a very high level way. We think of ourselves like, I'm going to walk over to the other side of the room here. But when we actually convert that into actions in the game, when we press buttons on the keypad, that, that single action is actually composed of many smaller actions. And that's what I mean by dilute. A single action here doesn't actually achieve very much. It doesn't change the world in a very significant way. 
And this is one of the reasons why MCTS can easily get lost in certain games if it doesn't have uh, any guidance on where to go. And that guidance often tends to come in the form of expert knowledge. So when we're trying to get MCTS to play a game like Sokoban, we might end up using our own knowledge of the game to optimize the way MCTS works. So for example, when playing Sokoban, MCTS agents often optimize themselves by thinking about the move in terms of moving boxes instead of moving the player. They still have to actually move the player into position to push the box, but in terms of reasoning, it's easier to think about their goals in terms of where the box moves instead of the player, because the, a box moving is much more significant in Sokoban, um, and it's, it's usually the, the interesting part of the puzzle solving. Moving around to push the box, that's not interesting. But the problem is that in many of the uh, areas that I'm interested in, things like general game playing or automated game design, we're in situations where there is no expert that we can ask for knowledge. We're playing games that we've never seen before, in some cases that no human being has seen before. And there's simply nothing to help us indicate what might be a way that we could speed up this process. So I wanted to look at a way that uh, I could assist my automated game design systems in deciding how to play a game efficiently. So what can we do about these problems? Well, back in 2019, and now this year again in 2021 in the Transactions on Games journal, um, I wrote a, a paper about reversibility and hyperstate space graphs with Azalea Rad. And the idea here was to tackle some of these problems in the context of state space graphs. So not, not agent uh, pathfinding or, or agent control, but just the general idea of analyzing a game. So let me tell you briefly how reversibility works. So if the effects of an action in the game can be undone immediately with one extra action, we call the action immediately reversible. So in this case, moving down can be immediately reversed by moving up again. It's a very simple action. And in the paper, we obviously go into detail about what it means to undo an action. We talk about state equality, but I'm going to gloss over that for today. Some actions are more complex than this. They can be undone, but only with a multiple actions. So in this case, if I push this box to the right, uh, this action can't be undone. In Sokoban, you can't pull a box. But if I were to walk all the way over to the other side of the box, push it back, and then walk back to where I was, that would undo the action. So when there's a chain of actions that reverse something, we call this eventually reversible. So we've got these two concepts, immediately reversible and eventually reversible. And in the hyperstates paper, what we do is we show how we can use this to reduce a uh, game state space graph into what we call a hyperstate space graph. And if you're familiar with abstraction in pathfinding, it's a little bit similar to this. Um, there are some differences, but uh, it's, it's a similar sort of intuition. So we have this state space graph that describes all of the different states that our game can get into. And essentially, anywhere there's a, a cycle, anywhere that uh, a state can be reached back to itself, um, we end up compressing that into a single state. So this collection of two states on the uh, right of the original graph here, these get compressed into a single state representing both of those game states. Um, and similarly, this, this cycle of four states in the middle, they get compressed down to a single hyperstate that represents all of them. And you can see that the resulting hyperstate space graph on the right has far fewer uh, vertices, far fewer edges. It's a simpler graph, and it allows us to think about the game at a much higher level. Um, and as a result, it is also just easier generally to reason about. So that's how reversibility works. And the basically, the entire of my talk is contained in the next slide. So our idea, essentially, is to take this idea of reversibility, take this idea of compression, and apply it to the MCTS tree while it is being constructed. So let's say that this is like a portion of our tree um, and we end up going down to the left-hand node, we expand it, we, we create all of its child nodes, all of the possible moves we could take, and we notice, aha, this state that we've just expanded is the same as one of its antecedent states, one of its parent states up the tree. And so what we do here is we perform a similar kind of compression that I just showed you in the previous slide, and we decide that we're going to compress all of these states in this cycle. In this case, it's just three of them. But we're going to compress them together into one kind of hyperstate node inside the MCTS tree. Now, this process is a little bit complicated, um, and there's a lot of writing about how it works in the paper. Um, I have a nice uh, <laughs> animation here of how, of how it's going to work. 
First of all, um, anything that is not part of the cycle, we sort of chop off. So this child here in the center, that's not part of this cycle. It's not part of this loop. We're going to deal with it later. Going to cut that off. Then we get rid of uh, the node that was duplicated, essentially, the node that told us there was a cycle. Obviously, we don't need that because we, we know that node is already in the tree, so we don't want that anymore. And then all of the other nodes in the cycle, like this one on the left here, they're going to get absorbed by this root hyperstate at the top. So what we essentially do is we keep a note of it. I'll come back to that in the next slide. Um, but we essentially compress it into this hyperstate node um, that is now part of the tree. And this node in the tree now represents more than one state. It represents two states. And as hyperstates and reversibility uh, showed in the previous slides, what this means is that all of these states compressed into this node here are essentially equivalent to one another. They can be reached mutually from each other without changing the state of the game. And then the last step is simply to take all of those nodes that we cut out of the tree originally, this dangling node at the bottom, and reattach it to the tree. So what we've ended up with is an MCTS tree that still remains true to all of the things that an MCTS tree needs to do. Um, but we've removed a bunch of nodes from it and we've gained a load of extra information and efficiency. Now, if you know how MCTS works, you might be kind of raising an eyebrow here because we've made a couple of changes to this tree and it doesn't look like a valid MCTS tree anymore. And you're absolutely right. There are a few adjustments. Um, I don't have time in this talk to go through the algorithm in detail, but I am just going to give you a, a quick overview of a few adjustments that we make. So the first thing that we do, and I've already kind of mentioned this, is we record hashes of all of the states that we've compressed. So when we remove a state from the tree, when, when we remove a node from the MCTS tree, we still want to remember that it was there. We want to remember what we've done with it. And the reason for that is that it's really useful later on to be able to compress these states down. So if you look at this tree node on the left here, if we were to compute its children, one of its children would be this state here moving to the left. But we've already seen that. So we would detect that this node had already been subsumed. It's already been compressed. And instead of generating it and compressing it again, we simply wouldn't generate it. There's no need to. We already know what happens as a consequence of this node um, because we've already compressed it into a node earlier in the tree. So the hashes help us be more efficient as the search goes on. We also need to change the way we record information about descending the tree. So normally in an MCTS tree, the uh, connections between nodes in the tree represent an action being taken, a single action. And it basically says, if, if you take this action in this state, you will end up in the child state. But now the child relationship is more complex because as we're compressing and moving nodes around the tree, it's no longer describing a single action, but potentially multiple actions. So we now maintain action lists instead of just single actions. And you can see here that now, instead of just going uh, down or right, um, in order to get from the hyperstate node in the middle to the node on the left, we have to go down and then right. So it's two actions. And note here how it's relative to the original state in that hyperstate node. So not any of the hashed states, it's relative to the first state that was in this node. And finally, the reparenting process. So the reparenting process I showed in the talk was very simple earlier. Um, so I just want to show you a slightly more complex one now. Um, and don't worry if this uh, goes over your head or whatever. It's, it's, it is a hard thing to explain, but there is a, a much deeper and clearer explanation in the paper. So suppose we have a tree that looks a little bit like this. Um, we've already expanded a bunch of nodes. I've, I've labeled them with letters. And then our MCTS uh, algorithm decides to expand node G. And when it does so, one of its children is node A. Now this triggers a reversibility compression because A is already further up. Uh, it's already one of the antecedents in this tree. So we end up with a cycle that looks like this and all of these nodes need to be compressed. So as we saw before, the first thing that we do is we remove all of these nodes from the tree, add their hashes to this top node, and then we have this dangling subtree. Now, the way that this actually works, I just sort of showed you, I showed you kind of gluing it onto the tree before, but that's not actually how we do it with uh, this reversibility compression. What we do instead is we take this subtree and we attempt to reinsert it into the, into the tree as if it was rooted at A. And so what this means is that um, this dangling subtree essentially gets a chance to update itself in the tree, but it may not always be needed. So what we essentially end up doing here, there's a bad, bad animation there, sorry, um, is that this tree essentially moves over 
and it gets reinserted. So we already have a node here for C, so we don't need to duplicate it. So instead what happens is um, C simply adds on its existing data um, and updates C with like how many times it was selected, what the average score was. So this existing C node gains all of that information. So again, this is another efficiency. That node doesn't need to be there. We already know how to get from A to C, so we don't need to sort of duplicate it. But some nodes are unique. This F node hadn't been discovered before in the original subtree, so this one does get inserted. So we've lost absolutely zero information here. We've recorded all of our previous playouts that were contained within the C node and the D node and the E node, and the F node, which was new, we've added to the new subtree in a new location. Again, don't worry if that sounded uh, like a lot of information all at once. There's a full explanation of it in the paper itself. But essentially all we're doing here is we're just double checking that we don't lose any information that we need and we don't add any information that we don't need. It's a very efficient and precise process that means we only ever have what we need in the tree. So before I close out this talk, I wanted to discuss just one or two results. Um, I ran MCTSR, which is what I called this algorithm, on the microband test set. So this is 151 levels of Sokoban, and I did it against three variants of MCTS. So vanilla MCTS, no adjustments whatsoever. MCTS plus N, uh, in this case, the MCTS received a small reward every time it encountered a state that it had not seen before. So this is a very common optimization for MCTS and tries to avoid some of those problems I mentioned earlier. And finally, I added a variant of MCTS that never generated a state it had seen before. So this is sort of like a naive version of reversibility. It doesn't compress or reorder the tree, and it's strictly worse than MCTSR. Um, and I knew that when I made it, but I, I made it because um, a lot of people sort of think that's what MCTSR is, and I just wanted to sort of compare the two so that readers could see the difference, see that they are different. And the other key thing to, to point out here is that all of these are completely general algorithms. So none of them know what Sokoban is. They don't know how to play Sokoban. Um, they are completely general. So this is a, a computation comparison. So for the same amount of computation, the same number of iterations, these are the number of levels that they were able to solve from the test set. And you can see here that the vanilla MCTS is not very good. No duplicates is all right. It's better than vanilla MCTS. Um, this sort of overstates how good it is because it, it's a very naive approach that has really catastrophic failures on certain levels. And you can see that MCTSR is, is clearly way, way better. Um, and the same is true when we do time per level as well, time limited. Um, now, the really interesting thing comes when you look at the state of the trees that are produced by this process. So. Um, what I did was I looked at how many states were in each MCTS tree and how many of those states were unique. Um, and for MCTSR, what I did then was to look at essentially how many game states are represented um, in the tree. So the way that MCTS works is that uh, because it duplicates so many states, it means that for every 150 nodes that are added to an MCTS tree, on average, a single unique state is expanded. That's how wasteful MCTS is, the vanilla MCTS, when playing Sokoban. Now, no one would ever actually use vanilla MCTS to play Sokoban. It's not very efficient. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, but this is just a comparison to show you the difference between MCTS and MCTSR. For MCTSR, it's so efficient, it's compressing the tree without losing any information and reordering things, that for every node that is in the tree at the end, that represents seven unique game states. So it's really compressing the space down and representing it in a very efficient way. And it's around a thousand times more efficient than that MCTS tree. So to summarize, uh, the way MCTSR works is it dynamically restructures the search tree using reversibility compression while it's being built. And what this does is it gets rid of states that it are not important, not interesting, or that it's seen before. And it focuses on the decisions that seem to have an impact on the game. It's very, very powerful for what I call sparse problems. Those are problems where there are lots of reversible actions. It's quite a complicated process, but I really wanted to share it and I was really glad this paper got accepted because I think there's some interesting ideas there to build upon. Um, and, you know, it was kind of fun to work on an MCTS paper. Thank you so much for listening. Um, you might want to read the hyperstates and reversibility paper that we submitted to TOG this year. Um, and if you want to contact me, please feel free. Um, and of course, if you want to hear things from me generally, um, you can visit my website, possibilityspace.org. Thank you very much for listening.